Today's reading can be found on page 7 of the Church Bibles, and it's taken from Genesis 8, verses 1 to 19. Starting at verse 1. But God remembered Noah, and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, every beast, every creeping thing, Every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Thank you so much for reading. The concept of a brave new world is one which every generation of political theorist, songwriter, philosopher or playwright considers. Not only so, it's also something which I suspect every one of us is familiar with. I would suggest that everyone at some point in their lives is given cause to pause and ponder, could things not be different, better? Is this really all there is? The very fact that following somebody's death, we speak about them going to a better place, suggests that we have some inkling of something better. Indeed, one of the enduring Features, images in the aftermath of the Paris attacks in November was the street musician Davido Matello sitting at the piano, do you remember, just outside the Bataclan Concert Hall and playing Lennon's Imagine. So whether it's Freddie Mercury, this could be heaven, or Lennon, Imagine All the People, or Rugby Football, A World in Union, or Woodrow Wilson, The League of Nations, or the United Nations, or a political party, things can only get better or an ideologist like Marx, or a philosopher like Huxley, or just you and me browsing news feeds on our own iPhones and thinking, surely it should be better than this. There is some sort of reality within all of us, some sort of reality towards which rather all of us strive and long. And this concept of a brave new world is what Noah and the Flood is really all about. We saw that last week as we turn back to chapter 5, verse 29, where in the block of material prior to this block, when Noah is born, we are given a very short one-sentence summary of who he is and what will be achieved through him, what he represents, 5.29. Lamech called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief or rest 
from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. In other words, we're right to long for a brave new world. How can this brave new world be achieved given the reality of the wickedness of humanity, our sinful human hearts? How can there be a brave new world? We all long for it. Yes, correct. How? Through Noah. Just three points for us to consider. First, the brave new world and God's grace. Secondly, the brave new world and Noah's righteousness. And third, the brave new world and our trust. And I think what the author is wanting us to grasp is that you and I can be part of such a thing. God's grace. We saw last week the undeniable message of Noah and the flood is one of God's judgment on the corporate and individual wickedness of man. Remember chapter 6, verse 5, God's verdict on humanity, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, universal. Every intention of his heart was only evil continually, personal. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, internal. You want to persuade me that there is not evil dwelling within you, let me see your thought life. And so we saw last week the undeniable message of Noah and the flood is one of God's judgment on the corporate and individual wickedness of man. I have an American pastor staying with me at the moment, a very well-known man who preaches all over the world. He's going to be speaking here in England a lot over the next few weeks. He's staying with me together with his wife and six children under 12. Just bear that in mind. One of my children said, they're everywhere. (laughs) And he said to me this morning, what are you preaching on at lunchtime? And I said, I'm preaching on the brave new world and how it can be achieved. And he just immediately said, only through cataclysmic judgment. That's the message of Noah. Now, we love to edit that piece out of the flood account. Primary schools use Noah as an aid to children's numeracy. They don't speak about cataclysmic judgment. That's at the heart of the issue. Sunday schools frequently speak of Noah and salvation, but rarely of cataclysmic judgment. It's too strong for them. And other adult congregations, you will have noticed, are equally squeamish and have lost appetite for the holiness of God who cannot abide human wickedness. But the inescapable reality of Noah's account is that there can be no rest, no relief, no brave new world without an expunging or a blotting out of human wickedness. Do you remember the famous letter of G.K. Chesterton following a lengthy correspondence in the pages of the Times all about what's wrong with the world? And he just wrote, I looked at the letter this morning again, what's wrong with the world? In fact, he just wrote, dear sirs, I am. Somebody else said, were I to enter God's brave new world as I am, I would ruin it. You would, and so would I. Somebody commented last week, this is really heavy stuff. And the answer is, yes, it is. Uh, You and I, we would never have begun our message to humanity if we were writing Genesis like this, would we? It just, I think, serves to show the divine inspiration of it. Because like the best surgeon or the most expert financial advisor, God doesn't shield the patient from the truth. And the truth is, the reality of our human hearts, our thoughts, they just churn out things we don't like. And throughout the narrative, chapter 6, God plans it as an act of judgment. Chapter 7, God produces it as an act of judgment. And in chapter 8, as he reflects on it, God explains it as an act of judgment. So the lesson we learned last week is that there can be no brave new world, that you will face judgment, I will face judgment. We cannot be part of this better thing beyond without sin being judged. And it is utterly naive to imagine that we can create some sort of perfect existence without it. The progressive who believes in the perfectibility of human nature is in complete denial of the history books. But if judgment is one dominant theme in the text, then this week, wonderfully, God's grace is the other. In his grace, God mercifully acts to rescue Noah from his just judgment. Let's trace through, if you look at chapter 6, verse 13, 
here in scene one, there are ten scenes actually in the account. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, 6.13. That's an act of grace. He needn't have told us about judgment. The very fact that I'm telling you that there is going to be a judgment is a great act of grace. We don't deserve to be told. We deserve to be blotted out. But in his grace, God acts in mercy and reveals what's about to happen to Noah. What kindness. Scene two, Noah, all the way through the scene, in the rest of chapter six, is presented as as obedient, but he's only being obedient to the purposes of God as he builds the ark. God gives the dimensions of the ark, and Noah follows him. And then chapter seven, verse one, as scene three starts, then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household. Grace again, God gives the command, God orders. And then chapter seven, verse 16, I love this. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Isn't that great? I'd always imagined, you know, Noah pulling up some rope like this, but God actually shuts him in. Quite how it happens, we're not told. Grace, 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 grace. And then when we get to chapter 7, verse 16, we've had, when we get to chapter 8, verse 1, this is the turning point of the narrative the very central feature, God remembered Noah. Grace again. And then halfway through the first, God made a wind blow over the earth. Grace again. And then chapter 8, verse 15, then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. What then is the message? Well, yes, if there's to be any sort of brave new world, then God will have to blot out of the current global order, the wickedness of humanity. Logic demands it. There can be no new world order without human wickedness being dealt with. Justice insists upon it. Sin must be punished. And experience confirms it. Something's got to change. I can't just keep on turning over new, new leaves. They never work. There's got to be some divine act of grace And in his grace and mercy, God plans and acts to pluck Noah out of judgment, to rescue him through judgment, to preserve him and his family as the waters rise. So then, this wonderful account presents to us, right up front in the Bible, the twin aspects of God's character, perfect justice, perfect love. Perfect justice, sin must be punished perfect love. Here is the human race, Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, Japheth. God has passed verdict on them, only evil all the time, and by grace alone God acts to save. Every generation of man seeks the brave new world, don't we? In our human arrogance, we think we can achieve it, whether we're Marxist, capitalist, secularist, religious fanatic, or whatever. Cecil Parkinson, who died this weekend, I remember when Mrs. Thatcher died, Lady Thatcher died, his comment at the time, she genuinely thought that the wholesale release of capital would open the floodgates of philanthropy. Isn't that interesting? She genuinely thought that the wholesale release of capital would open the floodgates of philanthropy. A brave new world. What did the release of capital open? The floodgates of greed. In the, on grounds of parity, I reached for my copy of the Communist Manifesto this morning. I thought if we talked about Mrs. Thatcher, we ought to talk about Marx. Uh, Every preacher should have a copy of the Communist Manifesto on their shelf. In proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another is put an end to, the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put an end to. In proportion as the antagonism between classes within the nations vanish, the hostility of one nation to another will come to an end. In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Communism. Remember the shock of the author of Wild Swans 
when in Mao's China, as a tour guide, she stumbled across Mao's palace in its extreme luxury. Well, the lesson of Noah is that a new world order is possible only as God expunges human wickedness And that leaves us saying, well, if human wickedness is to be expunged, what's going to happen to me? Because the thoughts of my heart are only evil continually. Justice. And the message of Noah is grace. God provides rescue. You can be part of this brave new world, not through your own effort, not through your own work, not through your spiritual brownie points or air miles or loyalty card, but by grace alone. Second, we learn learn that a brave new world is available only through Noah's righteousness. Now, this is new to me, and I'm ready to be challenged on it when questions come on Thursday, because I've never quite read Noah like this before, and I'll be interested to know what you make of it. I think what the text is telling us is that survival or salvation for those who become part of the new world was only possible as they were led out by Noah, the righteous man. The fascinating thing about the characterization of Noah is that there's virtually none of it. So imagine you were making the film, The Flood, and you were trying to think, what kind of person should we portray Noah as? You know, is he a Clint Eastwood, chiselled features, rugged and all the rest? Is he a Russell Crowe? Or is he altogether a more metro figure, an Orlando Bloom or something like that? You know, what kind of guy are you going to turn out Noah as? You're not told. In fact, one author says there's so little given, attention given to Noah, he almost appears to be an automaton, which of course is not the case but he's given virtually no airtime by way of characterization, apart from chapter 6, verse 9, which makes the verse very important. Chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now, righteous is a very common word in the Old Testament and refers to somebody who keeps God's law. He was just. Blamelessness is far less frequently used. It means perfect. It's used of Abraham as the father of God's people. It's used as David as the king of Israel. It's used of Job as the righteous sufferer. But the phrase to walk with God is only used of Enoch in the whole of the Bible. And so there is a progr- in this verse, there's a progressive build-up in the characterization of Noah. Oh, he's a good man. He's more than that. He's a blameless man. More than that, again, almost uniquely apart from Enoch, he walked with God. And that's the only thing we're told about Noah, except that he did as he was told. And so as Noah's family emerged from the Ark of Salvation, Noah stands at the head of a new humanity, a saviour figure, who walks out from the cataclysmic judgment, followed by the people, those he has rescued, and the representative members of the animal kingdom. And I've been trying to imagine the scene. You shouldn't really do this. I hope you'll forgive me just for a little bit of, uh, of preachers wandering. I've been trying to imagine the scene as they came down the ramp into this virgin new world. We used to keep animals in uh, over, over the winter period for four months. And when they come out in March, you know, they prance about, they dance, they skip. They can't believe it as they go out into the fresh new grass. And you can picture these people who've been cooped up in the ark and, uh, you know, punching the air and giving each other high fives as they come down. And I said to, to Wes, is it a fist pump? And he tells me it's a nudge, but whatever this thing is they're doing as they come out. Wes is in the know in these things. He's uh, up with it. And the CNN reporter, except there couldn't have been a CNN reporter, of course, because he went under. But you can imagine, you know what I mean. Shem, Ham, Japheth, how has this been possible? Oh, because we listen to Noah. Through the blameless obedience of Noah. Because there was one man 
with the character and courage and obedience to be a herald, a preacher of righteousness, who warned us, who sheltered us, who shielded us, through whom we were saved. And so what I want to suggest to us is that Genesis is telling us we are right to long for a brave new world. It's not kind of wishful thinking. But that rest and relief can come only through cataclysmic judgment. Sin has to be dealt with. There has to be a purging of this world order of sin. It can come only through grace because you and I are sinners. There's no doubt about that. And we can only be saved if God acts to save us. And it will come through the righteous, blameless walk of one man with God. And I think that's what Genesis 5.29 tells us. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one will bring rest. There is one. Well, we're going to discover in the weeks that follow that Noah turns out ultimately to be far from perfect. And so like many incidents of its kind, Noah is perfect ultimately a letdown. We're only in module three of the whole Bible after all, but here we are given a model at the head of God's revelation to us. This model of one blameless man through whom God will bring relief to this sin-cursed world. That God saves his people from cataclysmic judgment by one man who walks blamelessly with him. And I think that's what the New Testament makes of it. You can always confirm whether you're on the right tracks by just tracing through and saying, well, what does the New Testament... Just flick, would you, in the last couple of moments to page 1221, 1221. 1 Peter 3, this little passage has got some big, big difficult issues in it, so we're going to break in halfway through and ignore the difficulties and take it from the second line of 1 Peter 3, verse 20. It's page 1221, 1221. We're going to ignore the prisons, spirits in prison. I'm sorry. Halfway through verse 20. God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. Now, Peter's point here is it's not baptism itself, it's what baptism symbolizes or represents. And what baptism represents corresponds to what happened at the flood. As Jesus died on the cross for human sin, a perfect, blameless man... And as he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, so Jesus achieved the ultimate rescue to which Noah and his ark points. So that, yes, there is a brave new world beyond this world, but cataclysmic judgment has to happen. Sin has to be expunged. I have to be radically changed and saved by grace, rescued that that happens as I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and through his death, my sinful conscience is washed clean. I'm brought alive, joined to Christ, and so given a place in his new creation. We try to achieve a brave new world by our own effort, the big society. We try to achieve a brave new world through regulation, solvency too. We try to achieve a brave new world through man-made religion. We try to achieve a brave new world through brute force, ISIL, through ugly Victorian moralism, through personal improvement, my counsellor, my coach, my mentor. But the Bible tells us, yes, there is a brave new world. And as we come to Jesus Christ, who at the cross paid for sin, wash is our conscience clean, so we are given a place in his glorious new reality. We enter the ark of salvation. 
And so it has to be right for me to, to ask at this stage. It sounds cheesy, but this is the way the old preachers used to put it. Have you entered the ark of salvation? You come under the safety of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Will you be saved through the flood waters of God's judgment? There's judgment coming. It's only as I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and have my conscience cleansed that I can be fit for God's new creation. And then to say to you, if you are somebody who's done that, there really is a brave new world waiting for us. Be encouraged. Keep walking with the Lord Jesus Christ because this longing, we're right to long for it, but not to think that we can achieve it just by turning over a new leaf. So keep walking with the Lord Jesus because he has achieved everything that Noah points towards. Let me lead us in prayer. A good conscience we praise you, our Father in heaven, for the wonderful offer of your grace, of a good conscience, a cleansed heart, so that the thoughts of our hearts are made pure, washed clean, and that you fit us for an existence in your glorious new creation. And we pray now, if those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus, that you would enable us to walk closely with him to be men and women of righteousness as we seek to live blamelessly in this world, even as we anticipate your glorious new creation. In Jesus' name, amen.